So I will go ahead and get started with our introduction. We're thrilled to welcome Scott Skinner Thompson with to us today. He is an associate professor of law at the University of Colorado, where his research and teaching interests lie in constitutional law, civil rights, and privacy law, with a particular focus on LGBTQ and HIV issues. He is a widely published scholar and has a new book coming out just next month called Privacy at the Margins, which examines how privacy can fun function as an expressive anti-subordination tool of resistance to surveillance regimes. Prior to joining Colorado Law School in 2017, Scott taught at the New York University School of Law. In 2014, he was selected as one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40 in recognition of his important work with the ACLU, LGBT and HIV Project, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Transgender Law Center, and the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. Scott has felt, held federal clerkships both on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and also the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. He graduated from Duke Law School magna cum laude, where he earned his JD and his LLM, his master's degree in international and comparative law. I earned his BA magna cum laude from Whitman College. Um, if you will indulge me, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that in, despite all of his professional achievement, Scott is also one of the most thoughtful and generous and humble scholars I know. And so I am particularly thrilled that he agreed to join us today. I know you're going to enjoy hearing from him as well. Um, if there are any big cases on the horizon that sort of you're anticipating, whether, whether in federal courts of appeals or, um, or even district courts, any cases that you're watching where they're, where courts are using a privacy approach to um, to things like this. I know I think the transgender bathroom case you mentioned was a Title IX case, but I was curious if there's other cases out there, you've seen some novel developments or arguments that are coming through the pipeline. So, um, thanks, Jill. Um, uh, um, great question. So, in a lot of the um, transgender uh, bathroom cases, um, you know, I, I think that they, when brought by um, transgender students, uh, they sound often in both equality arguments, so Title IX or equal protection, but often they'll raise um, a, a privacy argument too and say that, uh, you know, forcing me to use a bathroom that doesn't correspond to my gender expression um, in effect outs me every time I use that bathroom because people will be able to note um, the dissonance uh, between uh, my gender expression um, and, 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 and the bathroom uh, 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 so, so many of those cases um, involve an aspect of privacy, that, 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 but they haven't been, um, they haven't always been centered in the bathroom privacy cases. Now, they have been centered in a, a cases challenging um, uh, restricted birth certificate or gender marker uh, um, law. So, there's been a couple recent victories in Puerto Rico um, and uh, I believe Idaho, where their restrictive law laws saying you cannot change your gender marker unless you've had a gender reassignment surgery um, have been challenged um, for violating the right to privacy and those have been met um, with uh, some success. One thing I'll say about um, percolating cases um, in terms of uh, government surveillance and, and, and law enforcement privacy is, you know, two years ago there was this important case um, called Carpenter versus United States um, where uh, the Supreme Court evaluated whether or not law enforcement needed a warrant to go to a cell service provider and get what's called historical cell site location data over a prolonged period of time without a warrant. And the government uh, and the court said yes. Okay, they said that notwithstanding that, you know, um, uh, Carpenter had shared that data um, with the with the cell company in effect because you know he you take your cell phone and your ping, you, it, it pings the cell tower um, and and that uh, showed where he had been over a prolonged period of time the government said in that instance um, a warrant was required in other words he did have privacy in public in, in part because it, the information wasn't really volitional people don't really think that they're sharing their location um, information and so carpenter may may have an impact um, on some of these rules uh, down the road but so far um, 
at least when it comes to physical privacy, um, you know, and in like, for example, government um, using cameras to surveil public space, we haven't seen it move uh, the, the, the needle much and, and courts are still saying, no, you expose your information to the public and so they can uh, videotape it. But we're, we're, that's still playing out. They haven't read your book yet, that's why. Um, <laughs> um, I've no got one a has. question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a question for one of our graduates, Laura Gonzalez. She would like to hear your views on the trade that we do with companies like Google that offer free services such as email and research engines in exchange for data. And she said, all of our searches and activity are in the public and are thus our free game. How can we stop the massive collection of data and possible negative biases against minorities? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Um, and, um, and so the, the, and just on this topic, while I'm thinking of it, there's been a couple uh, great books recent, uh, uh, written recently um, uh, about, um, about what I, what I um, uh, refer to as su uh, surveillance capitalist. I didn't come up with that term. Shoshana Zuboff, um, uh, wrote a great book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalists um, and Julie Cohen's written a great book called Between Truth and Power. And, and they really focus on, on that question. Um, uh, what do we do about these surveillance capitalist companies like Google and um, Facebook? A and I, I, I tell you, it's, it's going to be hard. I mean, I think part of their intervention and part of what Zuboff um, su suggests is awareness and changing norms and, um, and and part of what she suggests is consistent with, with what I'm saying is that we need to um, raise awareness and we need to change our, our own behavior. And, um, uh, and by so doing, we can change um, norms, expectations, and legal decisions um, regarding whether or not this information is truly surrendered or whether it's critical to um, not just our expression, but just human um, uh, flourishing. And, and uh, so I think part of, uh, part of the battle, um, you know, this technology, you know, uh, and this is another critique of these companies is, is that they don't, the um, design ethics are not really deeply embedded. They, um, you know, I'd sort of think of it like, there's some quote from Jurassic Park, I think, that they were too busy uh, figuring out whether or not they could to ask whether or not that they should, um, you know, recreate dinosaurs. And I think a lot of that applies to um, uh, surveillance capitalists, too. They're, they're, they're so focused on what they can do um, that they're less focused on what they uh, should do. Um, and on an individual level, I think that, uh, you know, purchase, uh, using your purchase power to support um, more ethical companies is is important, um, and then just talking to your friends and family uh, about it is equal is important. And then on a legal matter, I think appreciating uh, the expressive dimensions will um, hopefully hold some some purchase. Thank you. We've got a very timely question um, about medical privacy, and particularly as people thousands of people are sending COVID tests results yeah. to universities yeah. and places of business. What privacy rights are we giving up in those processes and what are some potential implications? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, I mean, there's a story um, out of um, Miami University of Ohio this week where a police officer went to a, um, a house party um, to shut it down. You know, they weren't uh, complying with social distancing and he pulled up one of the individuals um, he got his license as is routine and pulled it up. And in his database, the law enforcement officer was able to determine uh, that that person had tested positive uh, for COVID, um, which, which I think really underscores like there is a, um, pro th this data is, is permeating, right? Um, uh, systems and it's not, it's not necessarily being confined to um, uh, a um, context. Now, um, so my, my experience, my, my expertise regarding it, medical privacy is mainly in the HIV context. And, and so that's, that's in part how I view these things. And, and I'll, I'll say a couple things. The first is um, from a public health perspective, you know, contact tracing. Okay, that, that, that's why, you know, uh, institutions want to know your, everybody's status is so that they can engage in some form of contact tracing. And that serves a, a valid, um, public health uh, purpose. 
But and here there is there's a, a, a distinction between privacy and, and confidentiality. That information has to remain siloed. Okay, it has to remain within the institution um, doing the contact tracing. And it, it, because if not, if it starts percolating into other institutions, like that example I just talked about, um, one, it, there are two serious consequences. One is, you, you know, then you see the punitive responses. Okay, and I think punitive responses to public health crises are counterproductive. They deter people from knowing their status, okay, because you cannot be punished if you don't know your status, all right? Um, and we see this in the HIV context, like, oh, we're gonna criminalize transmission of HIV. Well, if I don't know I have HIV, I cannot be, I can't be convicted of that crime. So it deters people from knowing their status. Um, and that has a second consequence, which is it actually decreases the good uh, disease surveillance, right? And, and, the, and the contract basis. To contact tracing. So I think, you know, getting, promoting testing is key. Keeping that testing confidential. Um, and then that, and that, that is, that is different than private. It doesn't mean your med, your healthcare provider needs to know the information, of course, so they can treat you. Um, and um, there may be a room for some names based reporting to institutions doing contract tracing, but it cannot leak out of that or else um, we're going to see people not trust their healthcare institutions and not engaged with um, this uh, uh, monitoring. And, and we've seen that with, in the, you know, again, in the HIV context, we see that. And I think it, we're learning those same lessons in the COVID um, context. We got a couple more good questions. Um, one is, once upon a time, some vulnerable groups sought to be more private, for example, queer communities, or religious minority groups, um, perhaps to be more protective, um, or, but now we're seeing other vulnerable groups assertively and even loudly sort of seeking public attention. Does the latter appear to confound your notion of expressive policy? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, um, like all the other questions, uh, super, super great. and. Um, there's a tension, right, between visibility and, and privacy. And uh, undoubtedly, I, um, I'm a huge proponent of visibility. Like, I think, you know, and, 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 but part of the reason I think privacy matters is because it facilitates visibility on the marginalized group's own terms. So all of these laws I'm talking about that invade privacy, whether it's, you know, targeting Black communities, targeting Muslim communities, targeting queer communities, it actually does not make them more visible. It pushes them into the shadows. It pushes, it, it, it discourages them from entering public space on their own terms, okay? And, 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 and this gets back to the social construction and therefore influencing the, the social uh, tableau. True good visibility is when people are able to mediate their exposure how they uh, want to. And, th and that applies to groups as well as individuals. So I view privacy as facilitating um, controlled visibility um, rather than merely being acted upon and, and forced to reveal uh, and shaped by um, the surveiller. But, it, but it's a critically important um, uh, uh, point. And, and, this, and, and it's true in those contexts, but also in, you know, we, I talked a little bit about reproductive health in that context too, right? Like women's reproductive health decisions need to remain private, okay? At the same time, exercise of those decisions remains highly stigmatized. And how do we end those stigma? People, people talking about their abortion stories. And so, you know, there, there are powerful women movements within women's circles, for example, you know, shout your abortion, talk about uh, abortion. And, and, you know, and in the recent Supreme Court cases, um, there've been really powerful amicus briefs written by women who've exercised their reproductive freedom and, and had abortions. And they, they wrote briefs saying, look, this is, I had an abortion, and this is why it was critical to my human flourishing. Um, undoubtedly, those those stories shouting your abortion are key to destigmatizing. But no one—that's uh, each individual's choice. That should not be um, forced upon anyone. Okay, there's. I've got a long a question that's a little bit longer in the in the chat. That I'm going to just read. I am currently writing a memo on the use of cell site simulators by law enforcement 
and the lack of regulation surrounding them. Could you speak on why state and local governments have not implemented policies regarding search warrants, but the federal government has? I don't believe the Carpenter ruling was expanded to include real-time cell phone location information, which is what Stingrays collect. So, um, uh, great question. So Stingrays are where law enforcement, so Carpenter dealt with, um, you know, a cell phone communicating with an actual cell tower and then the government going to the cell company and getting the information from them. Stingrays are different because they, they pretend to be a, 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 a cell tower, but it's the government. And so the government's getting your uh, data directly. Um, uh, I, the, the law on that is actually better, it, it, at least the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. You, the, the questioner um, sounds more familiar with what's happening on a, on a legislative uh, uh, level, level, but I, I, I know there's at least a couple cases, I believe uh, one's called Lambus, where courts have said, no, that's, that's a Fourth Amendment search. Um, even if the individual cell phone account holder um, intends to share that data with the cell company, they do not I expect to share it with uh, directly with the government. In effect, it's a wiretap and therefore it, it, it implicates um, the Fourth Amendment. So I don't, I don't have any insights on the legislative um, front, I'm sorry, but on our constitutional um, front, hopefully um, those cases help you. And I'm off, offhand, um, one of the district court opinions, I believe is called uh, United States versus Lambus. Um, I've got another question that's actually about the Fourth Amendment. Um, this Emily Barksdale, one of our students, says, when I think of constitutional privacy, I think of the Fourth Amendment. And obviously, um, various court cases have clarified and expanded the definition, but is your, or in your opinion, have these cases gone far enough? And what are the next legal frontiers of privacy? Yeah. Um, it's, it's important, and 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 the short answer is no. I mean, I think the Fourth Amendment law is is really weak. Um, it, it's it's um, limited by this no privacy in public uh, ethos, sometimes referred to as the third party doctrine, sometimes referred to as the secrecy paradigm. That basically, once information is exposed to others, the government has um, free reign. We're seeing some modest pushback on that, but um, even if the Fourth Amendment uh, applies, and, and, and I appreciate this question, it gives me an opportunity to sort of compare the First and Fourth Amendment a little bit more. Even if the Fourth Amendment applies, it's really not that strong a protection. The government just has to go uh, show that they have probable cause and they can get a warrant. Okay, if the First Amendment applies and the government is targeting you because of, okay, if they're saying, oh, you're wearing a hoodie or you're in taking measures to protect your privacy, that is the basis for why we want to surveil you, okay? That is targeting your expression, is, is my argument, okay? And therefore, the First Amendment applies, um, and the government needs to satisfy strict scrutiny to target your expression, um, which is a more robust, um, uh, more robust test requiring a compelling government interest and, and, and narrow tailoring. So I, I think the First Amendment, um, uh, provides um, a, a more robust uh, protection relative to the Fourth Amendment. I think we have time for one more question if anyone has one. Otherwise, I will go. Got lots of good questions. Uh, so my last question is just, I think this is one of the things that struck me when I heard about your book was just such a unique approach to issues that people have not thought about in these ways. And so I was just curious, just sort of general guidance to some of our maybe policy students or future, but future articles or opinion pieces or maybe books in their future. How has it been going about writing a book, culling all these different ideas together in a book? And do you have any tips? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I guess I would just say it, it, it is, um, you know, writing, at least for me, is definitely an iterative process and my views of uh, these issues have evolved over time. Um, and so I, I guess to the extent I have advice, it's to be patient both um, in terms of developing your thinking and um, in terms of the pressure you put on yourself for outputs. Um, I, I know that's difficult because like if you're in a class or whatever, the last thing you, you have is time. Um, uh, and, and events uh, also, you know, there's an urgency to these things, um, uh, and, and we need to we need to get going. Um, but I, I, so as I think, you know, there's something to be said for embracing that urgency, but also be patient with yourself, and also, uh, you know, forgive yourself uh, and and be open to changing um, 
how you think about uh, different um, issues. Certainly, my thinking has has evolved even since I started writing um, uh, the book. Well, um, I join our Dean, Ian Solomon, who posted, thank you, Scott, that appreciates your time and your leadership on these issues. And I certainly agree. And you've given us a lot to think about. It's um, helping all of us look, look at these issues through a new lens too. And so we're really thankful for your time. And um, it sounds like some people got some good information for their papers and some of the things they're researching. So we're really appreciative of that too. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real joy. All right, take care. Thanks everyone for joining us and stay tuned for your uh, Constitution Day trivia. Scott, I'll send you a copy too. Great. <laughs> Good way to copy of your book. <laughs>